First, we're going to start with a panel on criminal justice and the media. To moderate, we're lucky to have Bill Keller. Mr. Keller is editor-in-chief of the Marshall Project, an effort to bring the highest quality journalism to bear on the criminal justice and juvenile justice systems, and which launched this past Sunday. For the previous three decades, he worked at the New York Times as a correspondent, an editor, and op-ed columnist, including serving as the executive editor for the majority of the past decade. Please join me in welcoming Bill Keller. You don't have to applaud. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and for inviting us here today. Um, you have before you uh, three veterans and one novice uh, in the field of criminal justice reform. I'm the novice. Um, my immersion in this subject, my full immersion anyway, dates back to March of this year uh, when I became the editor-in-chief of the Marshall Project. And if you'll forgive a plug, uh, the Marshall Project launched on Sunday. Uh, I hope that the website uh, we've pr we're producing will be the personal water cooler for everybody in this room. Uh, we'll have news and debate about criminal justice issues from around the country, uh, uh, large investigative projects, and maybe some fun stuff as well. There's a free daily email, so I hope you'll all go check it out at themarshallproject.org. Um, against my few months of experience with this subject, we have three people, each of whom has decades of experience. Uh, Mike Ward has been covering criminal justice issues for something like 40 years, nearly. Uh, he's currently the Austin Bureau Chief of the Houston Chronicle, which we know from Grover Norquist's presentation yesterday is ground zero for debate about criminal justice reform. Uh, Don Thompson covers the other state that is ground zero for criminal justice issues these days. He's the AP Bureau Chief in Sacramento, so covers California and has been doing this kind of work for 30 years, something like that. Just a reporter. Uh, just a reporter. What do you mean just? <laughs> um, and Ted Guest is, uh, among many titles, the Washington Bureau Chief of the Crime Report uh, and is the uh, President of Criminal Justice Journalism uh, and has been doing this for also for decades. So we have uh, three very seasoned pros on the panel today. Um, and I thought I would start by asking each of them to briefly talk about the state of coverage of this subject today. both the quantity of it and the quality of it, and how they've seen that change or not change in recent years. We'll start with you, Don. And Mike, let's start with you. It's, uh, there's more coverage now of criminal justice than there has been in previous years. There's more coverage by other media than mainstream media. Uh, the coverage is different than it used to be uh, because there's a lot more opinion out there. Uh, there's a lot more online uh, coverage. Um, the depth of the coverage, in my view, is much less than it was uh, 10, <clears throat> 15, 20 years ago. <clears throat> and I think the focus, in some cases, is much more on sensationalism around the edges of criminal justice. I'd say we've seen a, a decline in the, the coverage in, in that, uh, particularly with the recession, some of the rollbacks in, in uh, media coverage as a result, it's been uh, certainly decline in people covering it on a daily basis. Uh, California has been, has been mentioned a number of times already, has sort of seen this seismic shift. So certainly there's been a lot of coverage of those changes, realignment, uh, the Proposition 47 just in this recent election. Uh, and, and media has certainly done, I think, a, a fairly decent job of trying to explore those uh, more on an ad hoc basis as opposed to uh, uh, having reporters assigned to criminal justice coverage as a, as a beat. Uh, I think that's declined significantly over, over the years, mainly because uh, media has, has lacked uh, uh, the resources to do so, some of the mainstream media. And it's interesting that uh, I think I've mentioned that uh, two of the, the four people on this panel up here are now sort of coming at this from a different direction, a different funding source uh, than, than the traditional media that uh, uh, has been trying to cover this for decades. It's interesting to see you've been around doing this for quite a while, but we've got a brand new start here, and there's certainly that uh, uh, one of my, my colleagues and, and uh, competitors on the LA Times, for instance, is uh, part of our salary is paid by the Ford Foundation. It's, it's, uh, there's quite the overlap now that we're seeing, and it's a, a new uh, sort of dynamic, and we'll see how that plays out. As, uh, yeah, a, as a, lot of the journalism, a lot of the journalism world these days is nonprofit, but Ted and I work <laughs> for outfits that are nonprofit on purpose. Exactly. <laughs> Ted? I'd agree with my colleagues. 
uh, about the general picture. There's plenty of quantity of criminal justice coverage out there. The quality is erratic, partially because of the cutbacks that my colleagues have talked about. We do uh, a daily news digest, so I look at newspapers and broadcasts and online websites every day. Some of them are very good. Just to take one as an example, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, you may not see that very much. They do very good coverage of criminal justice following the local police, courts, corrections. Other, other newspapers and media, which I won't single out by name here, do not do as good a job as they used to. And that, that as my colleague said, is the biggest problem I see. There isn't a lot of local investigative reporting going on. There is some very good material out there. Just to give you an example, the Washington <coughs> Post, uh, the city where I live in, has done a great series recently on uh, uh, civil asset forfeiture, which is a huge topic in criminal justice. And that's great. And some other media have picked up on that. But you're not going to see coverage of that probably in your local media, unless there's some big scandal going on. So there's good news and bad news. It, just on the topic, and I know we're going to get to this, that you all are interested in at this conference, there actually has never been great media coverage around the country. So uh, we're, to use Bill Keller's phrase, we're starting, sort of starting from ground zero, although the panelists here have all covered it. I think you would all agree there has not been great consistent coverage of corrections issues, so that's what we're here to discuss today. So if you guys could wave a wand and, and change something about the media approach to criminal justice, what would you, what would you want to fix first? I Any? think resources is a big one. It's, uh, um, I mean, everybody's trying to figure out a way to uh, make journalism pay, and not, none of us expect to get rich up here, but it's, uh, it's the kind of thing where we've seen our colleagues laid off. It's, uh, uh, coverage cut back, um, changes in emphasis. We've seen the growth of, uh, of foundation-supported uh, reporting, um, which brings potential and, and pitfalls. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, we'll see how this is all evolving, but it's certainly I think that is uh, uh, fewer resources to throw at it. Uh, we're talking uh, uh, off stage here about uh, uh, you know, lawsuits to, to force the release of public records. Uh, people are more reluctant to do that kind of thing because there's, uh, again, financial uh, disincentives. So that's uh, certainly been an ongoing issue and, and will continue to be. Right. I was interested that Ted mentioned Milwaukee because I, ha I have the impression if you wake up in Manhattan, you read the New York Times, you listen to NPR while you shave, you read the New Yorker, uh, you get a pretty big dose of serious, uh, uh, relatively deep coverage of criminal justice issues. I expect if you wake up in Texas or California where those issues are sort of unavoidably in the news all the time, whatever you think of the depth and quality of it, there's certainly a lot of it. But what about the country at large? It, uh, are they um, getting much beyond the sort of superficial crime report? I don't think they are in a lot of cases. <clears throat> I guess if I could wave my magic wand, it would be to educate a lot of reporters about how the criminal justice system actually works. And um, because I see a lot of reports um, that are pretty superficial and it almost makes me want to cringe in some cases because uh, it's obvious to me that um, the reporter who was covering that particular story, and this probably goes back to resources and time, but the reporter who was covering the story did not understand the system that they were doing the story on. And I just want to reach into the TV screen or call somebody on the phone and say, if you'd have just known about this other component and how this thing fits together in a bigger picture, uh, you could have had a much better report on that. But that, in a lot of cases, goes back to resources. It's uh, reporters are given time, two, three hours to do a report. They're doing a lot of other stuff. And uh, so that's one of the problems now. Right, and I think in places that have criminal justice beats or crime beats or cop beats, the turnover is so <coughs> rapid that you never really get to understand either the institutions you're covering or the policies which are complicated and sometimes a little dry at first blush. 
Well, in, in, when I first started covering prisons in the 1970s in Oklahoma, um, I was given the beat, I was a young reporter, and nobody else at the paper wanted it. Mm. So, um, because no one wanted to go in a prison and get spit on and, you know, all the other stuff that happens in there sometimes. Um, so, but it, there's great stories to be told out of the criminal justice, justice system about the humanity, inhumanity, a lot of the things that are working, the things that aren't, that aren't working so people can understand what needs to be fixed. But in addition to that, um, this, the, the reintegration, the treatment programs, all this other stuff that's going on now that there's great interest in at this conference, there's thousands of stories there that are just waiting to be told. There's great opportunity there for reporters, I think. Um, let me ask you this, Don. Um, aside from the adequacy or inadequacy of our actually c covering the news, um, I wonder if the media writ large isn't part of the problem or hasn't traditionally been part of the problem. I'm, and I'm referring to the sort of if it bleeds, it leads coverage of crime in most local TV stations, radio stations, uh, a, 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 and a tendency to sort of exaggerate. We cover the crime, we very rarely follow up and cover the, the trial, the conviction, or the acquittal. Um, uh, we don't cover a lot of the institutional um, stuff that, that requires patience. And, you know, polls show that most Americans think the crime rate is going up. Uh, and I wonder if, to what extent that's a, a function of us having created this sense of drama uh, uh, and ignoring the fact that something important is happening in the lowering of the crime rate. And we've seen, it, it's been interesting in California, and, and you've heard, I think, from other panels and, and the, the moderator today, uh, certainly California has seen quite a, a few changes here, and it's been uh, uh, myself, my colleagues, uh, uh, diving in on some of these changes where we've got a number of uh, people who used to go to either state prisons or county jails are now out on the streets. And there's been these anecdotal uh, examples, some of them quite horrible, about uh, you know, people committing other crimes. Um, some of them actually linked to the laws, many of them not. But we've not seen, as you've heard from, heard from others, uh, uh, an increase in crime. It's been down across all uh, categories, property crime as well as violent crime. So it's, it's been that kind of dynamic and, and trying to get that across. We did a, a story just before the, the election talking about some of the changes under Governor Jerry Brown, uh, some of which he was dragged kicking and screaming into, but uh, on his watch nonetheless, and uh, trying to point that out, that, it's, that for all these changes, we'll see if it continues, and we hope it does, but the uh, crime's still been down. So trying to make that point there. Um, but I do think that kind of gets lost sometimes in the, the, the coverage and some of the, uh, the horror stories out there. I think the media actually have been pretty good about reporting that crime is down in this country. So if anyone is paying any attention, uh, you would know that. And certainly we are guilty of sensational coverage with some crimes, but uh, uh, I think overall we give a pretty accurate picture. Um, I, I think, and I think we would all agree in this room, because this is our business, there still is considerable crime in this country. I just checked on the figures today to make sure I was up to date. I mean, there were 14,000 homicides last year. That's much better than the 25,000 there were back in 1993. We all know back in the 90s, we had much more crime in this country, but I don't think it's anything for the United States to be proud of when we say, for example, the Crime Victimization Survey estimated last year there were 2.1 million cases of what they called stranger violence in this country. Again, that's better than it was before, and I think we've reported that, but I think it's up to the media to be creative about thinking of interesting ways to report the trends in crime and how the criminal justice system and other the agencies of government are handling it. So again, I think we have a responsibility to talk about the crime problem in this country, not to exaggerate it, not to say we're at a crisis point, because I don't think we are, but to keep a good, steady stream of, of responsible coverage going. Good point. Uh, one of the, I guess you could say, one of the overriding themes of this conference has been that there seems to be at least an incremental shift in the politics 
surrounding these issues. Uh, we heard that from Grover Norquist yesterday. I expect uh, the people here will hear it from uh, Newt Gingrich a little bit later this morning. Um, and I suspect that's partly because we have a generation that's grown up with you know, low crime uh, after the urban riots and the crack panic and all of that stuff. Uh, and a lot of it is because several conservative constituencies have embraced uh, at least part of the reform agenda. Um, first of all, I wonder what you make of that. And second of all, whether you think it's trickled down. Has it, has it really affected the politics of elections? Is it still risky to be an advocate of uh, criminal justice reform? Any of you? There's, you know, um, <clears throat> this last election cycle in Texas for the first time in a long time, there was almost no mention about, it was very few, if any, people who continually campaigned on, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna pass laws that are gonna put people in prison longer, uh, are gonna, you know, we're gonna find more ways to execute people. The general stuff that's been rhetoric in past campaigns. I know that uh, it's, it, this whole shift in the political support for reintegration programs has been interesting in Texas to watch because in the early 90s, Governor Ann Richards came in and she campaigned on drug treatment prisons. And they, the state of Texas built, um, I think there were 20 units that they built. Um, and uh, by the time they were finished, we had a new governor, George Bush. The budget had changed. There was no money to fund the treatment programs for those. And so most of those just became regular prisons. Um, by 2005, the political climate had shifted enough that a Democrat who'd been in the, in the Senate forever and a Republican who, when he first came into the legislature in the 90s, um, campaigned and voted for three strikes laws, they came together and started the push to get more funding for treatment programs and rehabilitation programs. And it's just kind of mushroomed in Texas since then, and it's been interesting to talk to people at the conference about the political dynamics of other states. Um, and there's a lot of parallels between how things have progressed in Texas and where things are and appear to be progressing in other states. Don, what about Cal in California, the opposition to reform has also been bipartisan. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's been interesting because, I mean, California, many people think of it as a progressive state, and we've really been following Texas's lead in some ca cases here, which uh, to the chagrin of a number of people in California. Um, but it's, it's uh, voters the last two election cycles have supported um, changing state law, some of the, the three strikes law, and then uh, more recently, some of the, the uh, penalties for lower level drug and property offenses just uh, uh, earlier this month. And it's, uh, uh, in many cases, it's voters going farther than the politicians. It hasn't really been an issue um, in campaigns for governor, for uh, lawmakers, at least at many levels, but it's been where voters have, have taken steps that have failed to clear, in some cases multiple times, failed to clear the legislature, even though it's a Democratic-controlled legislature. It's a, um, uh, they've been un unwilling to take that step uh, to be labeled soft on crime, whatever, uh, to risk uh, those campaign brochures, and uh, the voters have gone beyond that. So uh, it's interesting to see if that, to some extent, rolls up to the legislature. And I hate to be the representative here of gridlock in Washington, but I guess I have to be. Uh, 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 unfortunately, the, the federal government has not taken steps as many of your states have in the sentencing area, and there's been lots of talk about it and uh, lots of bills proposed, but recently, for example, the story came out, or the, the story came out last year that the incoming chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Charles Grassley of Iowa, is opposed, or was opposed, to something called the Smarter Sentencing Act, which would make a lot of, some changes similar to what you've done in a lot of the states, and uh, he and some other people, like Senator Cornyn from your state of Texas, I think are still in the, uh, what I guess Bill talked about, a generational change. They're still in the last generation, back from the 1990s when we had this huge crime rate, all of these punitive sentencing policies, and, and at least they say uh, they're opposed to this, uh, some of these reforms, and uh, as you know, based on the last election, the, the, those two 
men, Grassley and Cornyn, and a lot of their colleagues are the ones basically running the Senate in this area. So yes, there, there clearly have been some changes in the political climate, but they, we haven't yet uh, fully turned the corner yet. I wanted to ask about two subsets of the criminal justice story that, uh, that we in the press write about a lot, maybe more than is justified, uh, uh, and that seem to be kind of moving uh, in, if not in different directions, at least not moving in the same direction. One of them is drug policy and the other one is the death penalty. Um, my sense is that um, as far as drug, po drug policy goes, at least as far as low-level, nonviolent drug offenders are concerned, uh, things like the Smarter Sentencing Act, which as you say may be killed by Senator Grassley, but, is, but has a large constituency, and Prop 47 in California, um, you, sen you sense that while outright legalization of marijuana is maybe not moving that fast, decriminalization has got some traction. On the death penalty, the, uh, even though you have exonerations of inmates on death row, you have botched lethal uh, injections. Um, that doesn't seem, the public opinion does not seem to be moving much uh, on that. Um, anything you want to say on the, either of those subjects and, and how we cover them? We've, well, we've seen that very much demonstrated in California in recent years. Uh, uh, back in 2000, there was a, a change uh, that long ago on on uh, drug policy where uh, most uh, offenders, again, voters uh, taking the lead on it where uh, the idea was treatment rather than incarceration. Uh, some of that didn't work out partly because of funding. Uh, there's been arguments ever since over whether how effective it was, but that was a, a, had broad public support. Um, there was a, a different topic, but uh, in 2006, uh, quite a crackdown on sex offenders, uh, global GPS, uh, uh, tracking, residence re restrictions. Uh, more recently, the voters have, have uh, in just this month, uh, uh, lowered the sentences for lower level property and, and drug crimes, but two years ago, su narrowly supported the death penalty, even though we haven't had an execution in California since 2006 um, because of court challenges. Uh, we now have a bipartisan group of three former governors, two, two Republicans and a Democrat, who are promoting a, a, a new, another an initiative that would go on the 2016 ballot uh, to speed up execution, saying this is, uh, uh, you know, it's time to get these things moving again. It's uh, um, far more likely that somebody on death row in California will die of natural causes than, than ever be executed. And uh, they say that that ought to be changed. So it'll be interesting to see uh, uh, what kind of traction that gets. Ted, anything you want to add? Um. Well, on the two different issues you mentioned, yeah, yes, there are changes going on. Well, on the death penalty, I think there still is support in, in a number of states for the death penalty for the most serious offenses. Obviously, we've had a lot of problems with uh, wrongful convictions, and uh, the, the overall number of, of executions in this country has gone way down. I don't see it ending very soon because in those states, of course, uh, Texas uh, were, were represented here as one of the big ones, but certain states uh, are going to continue it. There are problems, B Bill alluded to, in, uh, or in uh, getting the requisite drugs, but um, I think it's going to go on at least to a limited extent. And again, the public opinion still favors it overall, although the, it's uh, slipping. And on drugs, there has also been a, a changes uh, we, we've seen the marijuana legalization decriminalization medical marijuana uh, initiatives I don't know that there has been a broad change on uh, drug sentencing overall in the country uh, it, it's been discussed a lot and I think as bill alluded to there the, uh, gradually we're, we're getting out of the business of long prison terms for mere possession of drugs, but there still are quite a few people in prison. You all know the figures better than I do, but a, a large percent of people in prisons, I think, are still there on some kind of drug-related charges, and I don't know that that is changing. I haven't seen, I know a lot of you are working on this, but I haven't seen a lot of movement recently in the area of drug treatment in prison. There still are problems with drug treatment 
out of prison, the effectiveness of it, the monitoring of it, but I know with, all, with the drug court movement and, and uh, other things that you all are involved in, there's some movement in that area, but I think we have to agree it is still a pretty big component of the overall crime and criminal justice problem. Texas still supports the death penalty strongly. Less it actually so carries than, it out, unlike yeah, many other states. It's a, right, routinely. Um, the biggest issue there is probably going to be supply of the drugs, uh, as it is in other states. And uh, there is there's some trend downward of support in Texas, public support for the death penalty, mm -hmm. not anything notice or uh, market, but it's uh, it's trending down just a little bit. The the interesting thing to me that um, there's been discussion about decriminalization on some drug crimes um, and uh, some other tweaks in other felony statutes in Texas, and. Uh, <clears throat> There's concern in the legislature right now. There's been a number of bills pre-filed to decriminalize this and to change the sentence uh, on other offenses, felony offenses. There's some concern that if uh, legislators do too much of that at one time, it's gonna make them look soft on crime. Mm -hmm. So I think that is gonna play into how much additional funding um, is approved for treatment programs and stuff like that. It's all part of a bigger picture that's gonna have to fit together. So. And, and uh, legislators have to get elected, so they are uh, very cautious about signing on to too many reforms that are gonna make them look like they're soft on criminals, which of course no one wants to be. I was at another criminal justice summit a couple of weeks ago. There, there's, I think, one sign that we're all on an issue that's catching a wave is the number of conferences and panel discussions that are going on on these subjects. Uh, uh, this one was in New York at John Jay, and uh, one panel I watched at the end, George Stephanopoulos was moderating, doing a much better job than I'm doing today. Um, and he sort of, at the, as a last question, went down the row of panelists and asked them to, to sort of say one thing that's really necessary to move forward on criminal justice. And he got to uh, a quite conservative judge from California, and the judge's answer was money that this is all going to come down to resources, that all the things starting with uh, uh, better policing, starting with uh, alternatives to courts, drug treatment, mental health facilities, um, continuing through uh, indigent defense, which is overburdened in most states, uh, continuing through the issues of reentry, uh, how you train and house and uh, you know, otherwise equip people who are being released from prison for a, a life other than crime, that all this stuff is going to cost money. Uh, and I wonder if we're doing a good enough job of conveying the fact that these reforms aren't free. Uh, the media? Probably not. Money is, the, money is a big driver on this. I mean, uh, if you just look at Texas, which is being held up as a national model in some respects here at this conference, which at some level is almost jarring for me because most of the places I go and I tell them I'm from Texas, most people say, everybody's got guns, they go down the list of stuff, are you people crazy out there? And I show up here and they say, oh, you're from Texas, you've got a national model program down there. <laughs> um, but Texas, the size of its uh, correction system, it's huge. There's 109 state prisons, there's other uh, pre parole transfer facilities, uh, substance abuse, felony punishment facilities, all kinds of other stuff. And that takes a lot of money to operate. It takes a lot of staff to operate. And when you're having an oil boom going on in Texas like we are, uh, you can't pay correctional officers enough to keep them when they can quit a $35,000 a year job and go out and start driving an oil field truck for 80000 a year. So money is a big part of it. Money is the reason that the business community, the the uh, Texas Association of Business, which is the State Chamber of Commerce, has come in and is supporting a lot of criminal justice reforms uh, because they said it just doesn't make any sense to have all these people coming out of prison, going right back into their old environment, committing new crimes. Mm -hmm. We're spending too much money on law enforcement, courts, uh, prosecution, everything. And uh, so money is a driving part of the discussion. 
So, uh, but have we created a, or have the advocates of reform created a false impression that you can do this and, and, <laughs> and over the long run actually cut budgets? Well, it's <laughs> been interesting because it's, be, it's actually been a big selling point in California as far as uh, uh, the argument against the death penalty was made not on moral grounds or anything like that. It was that, that California is spending a, a, an obscene amount of money on uh, a system that no longer functions, that basically that, that um, you're, it's a life imprisonment by a different name. Uh, that, again, narrowly failed, but it was, that was the point that the proponents were making. Uh, uh, similarly, on Proposition 47, the one that just passed, the argument was that you're wasting money putting people in prisons and jails, uh, that what the money should uh, be going for and the way it will be going is that, that those savings from not incarcerating people will be allocated to treatment programs, to truancy programs, to, to other uh, in ideas, incentives, to get at uh, what's hopefully the root of crime. There's a disconnect there, and we did just write about this, where uh, some of that money, uh, you've got people within two days of the, the initiative passing were being freed from prisons and jails as, as a result. Yet the funding for that is not going to be calculated until 2016. That money will then have to flow to grants and that sort of thing. So there's this, this uh, time lag there. Uh, it's been an underlying uh, uh, concern, the uh, uh, initiative back in, in 2000, uh, where it was the first attempt to try to say, OK, let's go with treatment instead of incarceration for drug offenders. Uh, there was a funding source, but it ran out after a few years. And, and that's been one of the big uh, kicks on that is that, that it uh, was less than effective uh, and partly because the money wasn't there. Uh, some of the realignment programs, you, you may have heard this from panelists yesterday on the, the California panel, uh, certainly the counties feel that they need a lot more money to make uh, uh, some of the changes that they're being called upon. And that was passed in part, not partly because there was a hammer from the, the federal courts, uh, partly as a budget uh, uh, maneuver to try to, to free up money for the state uh, general fund during the height of the recession. So it, it's been a common denominator. Uh, yes, got the, I, I think money is a big issue and the media should pay more attention that basically what this whole conference is about is, the more, is about the more efficient spending of money in the corrections area and that's a pretty big topic but we in the media don't spend enough attention to it. I don't think it's in the cards right now. I'm sure we would all agree to have much more money spent in the criminal justice area. In fact, a lot of you probably are aware, but the public isn't. Just to give one example, there's a lot less money, uh, federal money, going into juvenile crime, juvenile crime prevention area than there used to be. I think it's been cut in about half in recent years, which is not very good. But um, so yes, we, we should all be spending more atten attention on how can we spend the limited amount of money we have in criminal justice more efficiently. We've got about 15 minutes left, and so this is your opportunity to tell us um, what stories you think we're missing. Uh, we, the media writ large, not the people on this panel necessarily, uh, or what we're getting wrong, uh, what we ought to be, uh, what we ought to understand better than we do. There are people with microphones roaming the aisles, uh, and um, whoever gets the microphone first gets to ask the first question. Right here. I'll give you a quick answer, my quick answer, and then the others can, can chime in. Uh, I, I think we have a data reporter at uh, the Marshall Project. Uh, a lot of newspapers do that now. And it's important to, to make sure that the, the, the things that you report are backed up by facts. Data can also be a little seductive. It can, it can sort of lead you down the wrong road. I sat in on a really interesting discussion yesterday about recidivism rates. and. 
uh, if you slice the data one way, it tells you one thing. If you slice the data a different way, it tells you something else. So the difference between having great data and applying data to actual solutions is, is, is huge. Um, for those of us in the news business, uh, if, you, if we just write about data, uh, we're going to have the effect of sort of Novocaine for the brain. You, uh, you, know, you need to humanize the stories, and anecdote helps you do that. It's been interesting for us in California. Uh, uh, the, uh, we went through this realignment program uh, now three years ago, and uh, one of the things that was notably missing from the the change was any uh, funding for data for any research on it. So it's been as trying to cover this. It's the, the bottom line is okay. What kind of effect is it having, right? And it's we've got uh, because of the way it's working out. Instead of covering, for instance, one correction system. I'm trying to cover 58 correction systems for each of the counties, where they're the ones now on the, the front lines in many respects. And uh, there's been some of, you know, universities, some foundations, that kind of things have, have tried to step up with some, some aggregating of, of data. We've actually had to do our own in, in some cases, or, you know, reaching out to every county or reaching out to the top 10 or, or uh, gathering data from each of these counties and then trying to, to make it into some. Uh, a coherent form and, and tell a story again with some anecdotes and that kind of thing to, to put a human face on it. But that's been one of the real challenges is trying to uh, to say, uh, okay, beyond anecdotes, what what are we actually seeing here? And we're starting to see that gap filled with some of the uh, the research, but it's uh, it's been a challenge. I agree with my colleagues, but I, I think a lot of us are aware that the public is not aware of the flaws and missing items in justice system data, the, after the Ferguson event, there's been a lot of commentary that no one even knows uh, how many police shootings there are in this country. I mean, that's just to give you one example. And crime, there's lots of data out there, but uh, uh, lots of misunderstanding about it. I would say most of the public doesn't understand the difference between the FBI's Uniform Crime Reports and the National Crime Victimization Survey, which of course because of unreported crimes, huge differences there. In fact, a, right as we speak, a National Academy of Sciences committee is working on all of that, trying to do a, a pretty good, a thorough analysis of what is missing and what is flawed in Justice Department data, but it, it's a, it justice system data, but it's a pretty big problem. To, it, it's up to us in the media and to some extent to help sort this out for the public, and we could do a lot to, better job at it. One, one of the problems I've seen that's increased in the past 10 years is that instead of covering a criminal justice system, it's almost like reporters have to cover 20, 30, 50, whatever, criminal justice systems. Because as state funding has uh, been pushed down to the counties and even to some municipalities in some states, to fund diversion programs and to fund drug courts and to fund, you name a whole lot of stuff, probation programs and whatnot, to try and keep people out of state lockups so the state doesn't have to you know, pay the, uh, the cost there. Um, each one of the systems is becoming its own little self-contained system. Mm -hmm. And in Texas, which has 254 counties, um, it's potentially your worst nightmare trying to keep up with all that stuff. The, the uh, state does a fairly good job of overseeing this, but um, as far as finding the stories, and you get data sets out of each county, but the data may be different from one county to another. And uh, so it, it complicates, um, I think, public understanding and in most cases media understanding too as to how the system actually works. Yeah. Are you guys all following serial? No? Yes? Some. Uh, everybody at the Marshall Project is completely addicted. Um, next question. I respect the challenges you face in terms of shrinking budgets in newsrooms, the era of self-publicizing by us, and the rise of niche mark media outlets. How can we, the states, pragmatically aid and assist you, the mainstream media, in delivering a deeper message and story on our important criminal justice reforms because at this time, we need you. Uh, in a few words, less spin, more access. Um, at, at the moment, one of the things that we've been doing is gathering uh, 
state-by-state state reports that the states are obliged to file under the uh, Prison Rape Elimination Act. Uh, the state of Iowa, and I apologize if somebody from Iowa is here and is going to be, get their feelings hurt by this, the state of Iowa wants to charge us $2,000 for that information, information which Texas gave us for free, which California gave us for 50 bucks. Um, so the, the, the instinct of officials who run corrections programs to hunker down, to uh, not let reporters into prisons, to withhold data is not doing anybody any good, including the departments of corrections themselves. I'll give you some examples. Um, <clears throat> I've covered the Texas Department of Criminal Justice since 1989, and even for a while its predecessor, the Texas Department of Corrections. Um, so I know an awful lot of people. And generally, you know, TDCJ has PIOs, but a lot of times I'll just pick up the phone and call somebody and talk to them figure out what the real thing is, if it's a story or not, and then I'll, I'll talk to the, I'll go through the spokespeople sometimes. Um, generally speaking, the TDCJ officials are pretty accessible, but increasingly in the past five years or so, most of the media just goes through the spokespeople, who in a lot of cases, uh, they're wonderful folks, but they haven't been around for a while. And I've seen a number of instances where their answer to an initial question about some program or something is just wrong. And uh, in several cases, makes is gonna get a negative story, frankly. And uh, so when some of the reporters who work for me say, here's what they told me, I'm going, that's not right because I know it's not. And so um, more access yields better information which can benefit agencies when they're trying to get the real information and the straight story out. And uh, so I agree with Bill on that. Um, I know that's probably counterintuitive to a lot of um, kind of official reaction potentially on stuff, but uh, I've seen a number of cases where an incorrect story would have been out there had it not been for the fact that someone actually knew, uh, been around long enough to know what was really going on in that program and actually know, being able to call somebody and say, is that right? And they go, no, that's not what we're doing. We've sort of been hit with a fire hose, I guess, in California, just with uh, so much that's been going on. So it's not for a lack of stories or, or anything like that. It's just, uh, I've got somebody stacked up. It's a matter of getting to them at this point. So it's uh, uh, breaking through that clutter is uh, probably the toughest part, but we're always looking for, you know, angles and anecdotes to, to illustrate that sort of thing. But We've got uh, 58 counties now trying to uh, implement some of this stuff and trying to keep track. We've got a, a team of uh, three reporters that are uh, sort of a prison focus beat. Um, so it's not for lack of, of uh, covering it. It's more just trying to sort through all the, the uh, various story angles and, and developments at this stage. But uh, to echo my colleagues and to answer the question, yeah, put out more information to us, whether it's in news releases or just telling us about reports data that are out there, and as, as Bill said, you know, don't worry about the spin too much. I know a lot of you are concerned, am I gonna get a good story out of this or a bad story? Well, you don't know necessarily, uh, but put out the information and be available to answer questions about it and, make, and don't be shy about making suggestions. Not all of them are gonna be taken, but, but uh, reporters, a lot of them have more limited time than they used to, to to, and you don't assume that they just know what's going on in your agency, they probably don't. And one thing, I don't think any of us have really focused on this to make sure uh, we know what we're talking about. You have to focus on what the media are. In the old days, so to speak, 20, 30 years ago, it was sort of you knew what the local newspapers and radio TV stations were. Now, there are all sorts of other media out there. there are our local blogs, uh, websites of all kinds, and I know it may sound a little labor intensive to figure this out, but most of your agencies have public information officers or people who follow this stuff, so make sure right from the outset you're identifying who the media are, because as we all know, we're all getting information 
from all sorts of different sources. You can't, you can't hit them all, but make sure you're not just uh, back in the last century just communicating with a couple of newspapers and a couple of TV stations because uh, there's a lot out there. But that's, it's an opportunity to get your story out there. Well, and another opportunity would be to, you know, mental health is a big issue in correctional systems. So a lot of mainstream media and other media are focused on mental health, medical coverage. Those people really understand those programs. So even if your local uh, media doesn't have somebody who's covering criminal justice, they've probably got somebody who covers medical issues or maybe interested in mental health issues. So there's, there's potential opportunity there to go tell those stories through reporters who may cover this from some little different angle, but they understand the subject. We've got time for one, maybe two more questions. Sir? Good morning. Uh, I'm a trial court judge from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, you asked what I'd like to see more coverage of, and it's the big picture issue of mass incarceration. Um, if you ask most Americans, they'd tell you that they live in the greatest country in the world. Um, it wouldn't be able to tell you that we lead the nation or the world in the number of people we incarcerate. The statistic was given out yesterday. We have 4% of the world's population. We have 25% 25, 25 of its prisoners. Everything else stems out of this bigger picture issue of mass incarceration, you know, success of drug courts. Um, other tools that we use to address this problem will come out of the big picture issue of mass incarceration. I think more focus to the public that we are in this circumstance will drive the solutions. When the, when the public gets behind a problem, you know, that's when it gets solved. So if you can help with that, we'll be much better off as a society a couple years down the road. Thank you. I think everybody up here has probably written the 2.2 million number, the 5% the versus 25% number, the, uh, uh, and we, we will write that number over and over again. Um, that only gets you so far, of course. You know, w once you've identified the problem, uh, you're partway there, but then you have to start identifying some solutions. Anybody have anything else they want to say on, the, on mass incarceration? Well, I, I, I agree with the judge. Uh, it still comes down to statistics are great. Uh, there's a lot more statistics out there now than there used to be. Um, but it still comes down to the human stories of those folks who are in the system, how they got there. And if the public understands, the better the public understands the criminal justice system, how it works and what the details are, uh, the better the information is that they get about their system, how much it's costing and, and uh, whatnot, politics of it, I think the better everybody's going to be served. Uh, the public, corrections agencies, um, local communities, uh, law enforcement, everybody. Yeah, we, we, have to, we have to identify for the public to get their attention what the problem is. And to just, just repeating the data doesn't necessarily get their attention. Or just saying there are a lot of people in prison may not uh, uh, do much for a lot of people out there think it's probably good that there are a lot of people in prison. They don't see the, the problems that we all see. So I, I just want you all to know that we all, to make a, a good readable story out of something, have, have to be able to identify pretty clearly what the problem is and, uh, to get people's attention. By the way, I always make a point of telling people that it's not 100% certain that we lead the world in mass incarceration. There's one other place that may come close, and that's North Korea. We just don't have the data. Um, we, I, I, have a, I have a stop sign being held up in front of me, so I think our, our work here is done. Uh, I have two more. <laughs> two more questions? Okay. Hi. Um, I just want to first thank you for starting up the Marshall Project. I come from Connecticut, and I know there's a big buzz about it, and uh, it's a very welcome addition to the, to the media scene in terms of criminal justice reporting. Thank My you. question is in terms of uh, race in coverage of criminal justice, and um, you know, in light of uh, Ferguson, in light of uh, you know, just general coverage within the media, and I would suggest uh, reading um, the Sentencing Project's report on race and punishment, racial perceptions of crime and support for punitive policies. 
And essentially, just to, just to briefly quote one, one line from there, it says, many media outlets reinforce the public's racial misconceptions about crime by presenting African Americans and Latinos differently than whites, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Qualitatively, television news programs and newspapers overrepresent racial minorities as crime suspects and whites as crime victims. I just want to hear your thoughts on it. This is a question put to four white guys. Um, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. I mean, the whole, the whole subject, I mean, we're, you know, we're called the Marshall Project in honor of Thurgood Marshall, the first African American justice of the Supreme Court and a long time. Uh, uh, pioneer in def defending indigent, mostly black death penalty cases, mostly in the South. Um, and the, the whole subject of criminal justice is suffused with issues of race. 40% uh, of the incarcerated in America are African American and another 20% are Latino. Um, there are, if you go to our website, you will find a, 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 a sort of by the numbers look at the criminal justice system and a lot of the numbers regarding race are appalling and alarming. Um, so we can't shy away from that. Uh, it, it makes some people uncomfortable to talk about that. Uh, some people read uh, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, which describes mass incarceration as essentially the third phase of slavery, and they recoil from that. They think that's extreme and radical. Um, but it's worth reading, and it's worth paying attention to because it's unavoidable. I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think the media do a pretty good job of reporting on uh, problems of racial bias, racial discrimination in the justice system. Are we perfect? No, we're not perfect. But, but there have been a lot of studies and reports out there, for example, about police uh, apparently uh, arrest, arresting blacks or other minorities disproportionately. And we have given pretty good coverage to that. Is it true that on some sensational crimes when a minority is the, is the suspect that that person's picture is widely disseminated? Yes, that is true. Uh, and it might give some people the wrong impression, but I think overall we have done a fairly good job of talking about racial disparity issues in the justice system. Am I, am I right? I know what, it may sound defensive, but I, I think we, we uh, covered that uh, pretty extensively. I, I don't know whether, you know, we've done a good job or not. Uh, probably depends on where you're viewing that from. I think that uh, what you're talking about uh, has been a, it's been a historical problem. There's been historical issues there, like Bill said. Uh, it has been a story. It's going to continue to be a story. Um, and it, it goes into all kinds of other stuff. It goes into stories about uh, prison, imprisonment. It goes into stories about coverage of gangs. It goes into you know, even stories about coverage of communities. So, yes, it's a story. It'll continue to be a story. Last question. An honor indeed. Thank you all for your panel. Um, I would basically like to say my time here, I've seen unprecedented collaboration between public-private partners, between federal, state, and local, between teams within local people, of, of many different places, schools, law enforcement, juvenile folks, the whole nine yards. I've seen bipartisan work, people who you wouldn't normally find in the same room, in the same room. And I've seen the theme being, we need to be smart on justice. We need to be smart on juvenile justice. So my question to you is, how would you cover this event? I'm sorry, how do we want How to would you write up this event? <coughs> well, I, I, is, is anybody here actually covering it? Yeah, <laughs> we're, uh, at least well. I'm not. But um, I mean, generally, I think that you're accurate. We're, we're just the talent, you know. <laughs> we're gonna, we, we've been seeing that, I think, on, in, again, California vantage point here, but I think we've been seeing a lot of that in California, and that's been an ongoing theme, uh, certainly. Uh, many of the states here, I think, have gone into this more voluntarily. California has sort of been drag kicking and screaming into uh, many of the changes that it's, it's undergoing, either from the federal courts, uh, from voters taking a stance, and then uh, leaving it to policymakers to make it work. Um, but, but there has been, I think, uh, much more of that, and we've been seeing it, and, and to the best we can, uh, 
reporting it. It's been part of the, the thread as we've been looking to, uh, particularly how counties are trying to implement this thing that's been thrust upon them uh, uh, in, in virtually all cases. I think just to, to add to, to my flip remark that <laughs> a, a moment ago, I, I think this is a terrific event. It's valuable for, the, for all of you to share these experiences that you've had in your states uh, and, you know, and across party lines. Um, this is, I think, the seventh or eighth conference on criminal justice issues that I've been to in my limited time in this field, uh, and they're incredibly valuable for the participants. They're not something that the press should be covering as events. They're th things that the press should be using as resources. I will take back a stack of documents on recidivism because we have a reporter who's fascinated by um, data, wonkery, social science, especially including, or particularly including recidivism. And I will hand over this data to her and she will probably call some of the people who were on the panel yesterday. And that will be added value. I, you know, I've been fascinated by the um, growth of the conservative interest and the conservative um, intellectual underpinnings for a, a criminal justice agenda. So uh, I'm, I did not write a story about Grover Norquist's speech, nor will I write a story about Newt Gingrich's speech, but both of those are contributing to my understanding of that, and at some point I'll want to write about it. So this, this conference and, and some of the others I've been to are, are genuinely valuable resources, but there's not a lot of utility in saying 400 people gathered together and here's some of what they said. It's not useless, but that's sort of the, the least valuable uh, use of, of your conference. In many respects, the story here to me is that this conference represents a growing national dialogue uh, that is part of a, a trend uh, in this area. And it's going to shift priorities and policies across the country over the next five to ten years. And the two things you said, public safety and we're being smarter on crime, those were the two main talking points that most of the legislators in Texas used um, to sell the initial reforms back in 2005 that are now being held up as models here. Uh, we're enhancing public safety and we're being smarter on crime. So, uh, and then of course, uh, I have to tell you that everybody in Texas kind of held their breath the first couple of three years to make sure this was going to work out, but it, the initial success of the program paid off and so now, you know, champagne corks uh, started popping, but uh, it is part of a changing national dialogue. And if you look back in history in the United States and criminal justice, you will see um, the bell curve shifts about over 10 to 25 years. And I believe we're probably in a, a shift on the bell curve here. Uh, so that's what this conference, that's what the, one of the stories out of this conference is for me. And with that, have a great rest of the day. <clears throat>Hold on one second, uh, we'll transition out of this session. Um, a lot of really fantastic observations from the panel. I want to do, try real briefly here to tie it back uh, to what I think a lot of folks in this room are experiencing. So you pass a reform, you, you work to implement it. At some point in the implementation process, somebody under probation or parole supervision or someone discharged from prison is going to commit a crime. It may have no substantive connection to the bill you passed. It may have some substantive connection to the bill you passed, but not at all reflect the public safety impacts of the effort you've undertaken. But at that point, it doesn't matter. The story's out there. We've heard it bleeds, it leads. It can, it can threaten to derail the work you've done. Let's look at the flip side of that. Uh, you, you, you invest in quality community supervision services and sanctions, uh, and you're actually able to reduce recidivism how do you tell the story of the crime not committed? There's a, there's a painful asymmetry in the kind of work uh, that folks in this room are trying to do. And I think as we heard from the panel here, you've got uh, strained and stressed newsrooms that can't uh, afford the kind of reporting, investigative reporting they used to do. Puts more of the responsibility on folks in this room to go and, and connect uh, those dots and to bring those stories forward and talk about, here's a guy who before wouldn't have had access to X, Y, and Z. Now he does. 
he's staying uh, uh, with his family or he's paying child support or he has a job or he's staying sober or you know, continue that story and try to figure out how to tell that story because I think as we heard, data is one part. It, you, can't, you can only write so many stories that are just numbers and you have to tell some stories about people.